Riding the rails became a common method of transportation in the United States after the Civil War. The railroads were pushing west, and with the war over, many young men were looking for a more promising future somewhere else. Hopping on a freight train became easy, free transportation that could cover a long distance. The popularity increased again during the Great Depression when people were traveling for jobs they had heard about hundreds of miles away. Today, rail hopping is much less common, but there's still a network of people who use it as a means of free travel. In the U.S., it's illegal, and it's extremely dangerous. Jumping on and off of a moving train can lead to loss of body parts or death. Angel Resendez had an uncontrollable desire to kill. He started his life with a pretty low moral compass and spent most of it stealing to make a living. But soon, instead of just robbing people, he felt like he needed to kill them and couldn't stop himself. This is Monsters. Dr. Claudia Benton was training in genetics research at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. When, on December 17, 1998, she didn't show up for work that day and wasn't answering her phone, a colleague went to her house in West University Place, a Houston suburb, and knocked on the door. When she got no answer, she called the police from right outside the house and requested a welfare check. When officers arrived, they checked the doors and windows and found them all to be locked, but when they tried the garage door, it was unlocked. After rolling up the garage door, they saw that the doctor's Jeep Cherokee was gone and the door into the house was open. Inside, the house was ransacked. They cleared the house and found Claudia in the master bedroom lying on the floor covered with a blanket. Her legs and one arm was sticking out. When crime scene investigators arrived, they documented blood spatter on the walls and the bedroom door. A large butcher knife covered in blood was lying on a pillow by the body, and a heavy statue was also nearby. The medical examiner determined that Claudia had been stabbed multiple times and bludgeoned to death with the statue. She had also been sexually assaulted. Her husband and two twin daughters had been out of town to visit family for Christmas. They had been gone for a few days, and unfortunately, Claudia wasn't able to join them because of work. Her husband said that a guitar, a banjo, a meat cleaver, and numerous pieces of jewelry were missing along with Claudia's Jeep. He confirmed that there was only one set of keys for the vehicle. Investigators asked because they found Claudia's keys in the house. The attacker had dumped out her purse and rummaged through it. Her ID was out in the open, but none of her credit cards or cash was taken and the keys were still there. There was also partially eaten fruit on the counter. In the garage, investigators found a piece of broken steering column cover that belonged to the Jeep. The suspect must have hotwired the car in order to steal it. Fortunately for detectives, there was a fingerprint on the piece of plastic column. Two days later in San Antonio, about 200 miles or 320 kilometers away, police found the Jeep in a parking lot. The steering column was broken and inside was a guitar and a meat cleaver. When forensics examiners dusted for prints, they found nothing. It looked as though the attacker had wiped down the Jeep, but he had forgotten about the piece of plastic he broke off of the steering column. That print came back to a Carlos Rodriguez, but when they checked in a different system, they got a hit with the name Rafael Resendez Ramirez. Then they found 30 different aliases, a criminal record going back 20 years, and an active warrant for a stolen vehicle. On May 2, 1999, Pastor Norman Cernick and his wife Karen never showed up at the 10 a.m. Sunday service at the church in the small town of Weimar, Texas. At the least, he should have been there. He was the pastor, after all. Members of the congregation called for a welfare check on their pastor and his wife. The chief of police himself was called out of his own church to go and check on the couple. At the house, they found both of them dead in their bed, covered with a blanket. They had been bludgeoned to death with a sledgehammer taken from their own garage. It was believed that they had been there for about a day and a half, and the medical examiner confirmed that theory. 
They also confirmed that Karen had been sexually assaulted. Money and valuables were in sight, but they weren't taken. There was partially eaten fruit and other food laying around, and their IDs were out on the counter like the killer had been studying them. Their red 1998 Mazda pickup truck was missing. This case was quickly connected to the murder of Claudia Benton. DNA from bodily fluids collected from the scenes confirmed that it was the same attacker. Authorities contacted Mark Young, an FBI profile, so they could get a better idea of the type of person they were hunting. Mark said the attack seemed ritualistic. Not everything of value was stolen. He went into their wallets to get their IDs so he could look at them, but he didn't take the cash or credit cards. A few days after the murder of the Cernex, the chief of police of Hughes Springs, Texas, about 250 miles or 400 kilometers north of Houston, saw the report of the murder in Weimar and thought it might be connected to a murder that happened in his own town the previous October. 87-year-old Leafy Mason was found dead in her home and the medical examiner determined that she had been bludgeoned to death. Investigators believed that the murder weapon was an antique flat iron that had been found on the scene. There was evidence that the killer had stayed in the house and eaten food after the murder. Investigators sent a palm print collected from the crime scene to Houston, but there was no way to compare it to the fingerprints from the steering column and no palm print on file for Rafael Resendez Ramirez. The investigators knew that Rafael had stolen a car from both Claudia and the Cernex, but the Jeep was found long before the murder in May of 1999, so he didn't drive it to the Cernex house. They wanted to pin down exactly how he had gotten to the victim's homes. He didn't leave a different car behind. Did he have a partner? Someone who dropped him off or even participated in the attacks and then drove the other vehicle away? When one detective noted that the Benton home was about 50 yards from some train tracks, another detective looked out the window at the Cernax house and saw train tracks right across the street. It turned out that train tracks run right through Hughes Springs as well, so it looked like the killer was using the rails as his means of travel. Angel Reyes Resendez was born on August 1, 1960, in a slum outside of Puebla, Mexico, southeast of Mexico City. Angel began to steal when he was very young. When he was only six years old, he would steal fruit for some of the street vendors to sell. On weekends, he and other kids would hop a train to the city and steal from the richer people who lived in the area. He went to school, but to him it seemed like a distraction from his dreams of becoming rich. In order to do that, he needed to be out on the streets, thieving and scrounging. As he got older, he developed a strong love of football, or soccer in the U.S., and bullfighting. The love of football as a young boy in Mexico was pretty understandable but his love of bullfighting came after sneaking into the local arena to watch the show. He was fascinated by the battle between the matador and the bull, eventually ending in the bull's death. He grew to view death as a sport. When Angel was only seven, his mother became engaged to a man that did not get along well with the boy. The animosity between them was enough to send Angel to live with his uncle, Rafael Resendez Ramirez. Rafael farmed a small piece of land and sold his produce in a local supermarket, which made him one of the more well-off members of the Resendez family. After moving to his uncle's house, Angel felt abandoned by his mother and quit going to school altogether. He began hopping trains and going farther and farther away, sometimes spending days at a time on the rails. He spent years riding the rails and stealing in downtown Puebla, but when he was 12 years old, he left his uncle's home and never returned. His uncle believed that Angel had hopped a train for the U.S., but the boy was still too young to find work in the States, so he joined a group of street kids on the opposite side of Puebla. They developed a successful pickpocketing and burglary ring, which improved Angel's lifestyle significantly. It wasn't long, though, before some of the older boys in the group molested Angel one night, and he decided to get out of town. He set his sights on finally getting to the U.S., he hopped a train to Ciudad Juarez on the border of Mexico and Texas, where his mother had moved a few years earlier. Most people in this city migrated back and forth over the border, performing labor on farms during harvest seasons. Angel was 14 years old when he first crossed into the U.S. It was 1974, so it was much easier to cross than it is today. He used a mule to help him cross the Rio Grande, and then snuck through a hole in the fence into El Paso. At first, he would only go for a few days at a time to get a lay of the land and to work on his English. 
In Ciudad Juarez, he joined another gang of young thieves, and then he worked as a mechanic for one of the area's biggest car thieves. Angel had no interest in developing relationships with people, and he often left to ride the rails around Mexico and U.S. He had become proficient in English, even being able to read fairly well. In 1976, Angel crossed the border into the U.S. and hopped a train headed to California. Angel didn't make it out of Texas because just a few hours he hopped aboard, the train stopped and immigration officers caught him in one of the boxcars. One of the officers asked him for his name and without hesitation, Angel responded, Rafael Resendez Ramirez. This is how Angel Resendez became Rafael Resendez Ramirez according to the United States authorities. Angel's information was logged in the system and he was sent back to Mexico. Less than a month later, he hopped another train, this time headed north towards the Great Lakes. He had heard that you could earn more money the further north you went, and he wanted to take advantage of that. As soon as he jumped from the train in Sterling Heights, Michigan, he was arrested again, and after two weeks, he was returned to Mexico. This time, he gave a different fake name. Not all of his travels ended in arrest, though. Eventually, Angel was successful at catching a train and making it to another part of the country. He robbed a house in Detroit where he took a 38 caliber revolver. He learned that houses in Florida and Georgia were spaced further apart which made for better burgling. He learned that immigration agents only cared about who was coming into the U.S., not who was going into Mexico, so he would steal cars and drive them right back over the border and sell them to friends who dealt in hot cars. In 1979, Angel was making good money burglarizing houses up and down the Florida coast. He would break into unoccupied homes in Boca Raton and West Palm Beach and steal valuables before driving off in their vehicle. In July, he broke into a house that wasn't empty and the woman who lived there woke up and confronted him. He attacked her, but she was able to fight off the scrawny 20-year-old and he ran from the house and drove away in her car. She called 911 and police set up a roadblock where Angel was arrested. On September 6, 1979, Angel was convicted of auto theft, burglary, and assault and sentenced to 20 years in prison. After adjusting to prison life, Angel began spending most of his time in the library. He was very interested in conservative politics and applied to become a member of the U.S. Libertarian Party. He also began following the case of Richard Ramirez, who was arrested in 1985 and convicted of 13 murders along with convictions for attempted murder, sexual assault, and burglary. Angel felt he had a lot in common with the killer they called the Night Stalker. He was fascinated by how he killed random people in random ways, something that would go on to influence Angel. Angel was released from prison on September 3, 1985. Once out of prison, he was immediately taken into custody by immigration and sent back to Mexico. Angel spent years going back and forth from Mexico to the U.S. and back again. He almost got caught with a stolen car, so he quit doing that and just burglarized houses. He was arrested a number of times and spent short periods of time in various jails around the U.S. Every time he was arrested, he gave a different alias, but when they ran his fingerprints, it always came back as Rafael Resendez Ramirez. Angel didn't only steal to make a living. He did also work on various farms, making what would be as close to honest money that he ever would. He was working as an illegal immigrant, but I think the companies that exploit that labor are more to blame for the crime than anyone else. Over the years, Angel rented three lockers at a bus station in Ciudad Juarez, where he stashed money he had made along with clothes and other trinkets. By the late 80s, he had saved up quite a bit of money and he went to the small town of Rodeo, about 500 miles or 830 kilometers south of the U.S. border, where he bought a small two-bedroom house for $1,000. In Rodeo, he was offered a job at a convent teaching local children English. He saw this as an opportunity to get out of the life of crime he had been living and accepted the job. He thought he could use the cash he had saved to supplement the low wage, but it wasn't long before he quit and went back to the U.S. to burglarize more homes. While in St. Louis, Missouri, he tried to get a social security number under a fake ID. He believed the more identities he had to give to authorities, the better. It turned out that the clerk wasn't stupid and they knew that Angel was using a fake ID. The clerk notified police and Angel was arrested. 
He had been using the name Daniel Edward Arnold, but they matched the prints to Rafael Resendez Ramirez, and he was convicted to 16 federal counts, which included using aliases to obtain social security numbers, submitting false statements to the Social Security Administration, and unlawful possession of a firearm. He had a 22 caliber revolver on him at the time of his arrest. He was sentenced to 30 months in prison. Just like his prison term in Florida, he spent his time in the prison library, reading historical biographies and newspapers. In May of 1991, Angel was released from prison and deported to Mexico. Like every other time Angel was deported, he was right back in the U.S. a short time later. As the years continued to pass, he continued to travel across the border, burglarizing houses, getting arrested, being deported, coming back, and so on and so forth. In 1995, Angel went down to Rodeo for a little while and met a young woman named Julieta Reyes while shopping. She worked at the local health clinic, which was outside the norm, as most women in town worked seasonal jobs in the U.S. It wasn't long before Angel asked Julieta to move in with him. This gave him someone to come home to when he returned from trips to the U.S. Of course, Angel told her he was going to the U.S. to work on farms, when he was really going to burglarize houses. On August 29, 1997, 21-year-old Christopher Mayer and his girlfriend, 20-year-old Holly Dunn Pendleton, went to a party at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, where Christopher attended school. Universities have no shortage of parties on a Friday night, and the couple left so they could walk to a different party. They were walking along the railroad tracks that run right by the campus when a man with a knife suddenly appeared out of the bushes. It was Angel, and he demanded their money. Christopher told him that they didn't have any, so Angel ordered them to sit down and began tying them up with rope he pulled out of his bag. Christopher offered to get him money and even offered the man his car, but Angel wasn't interested. Once he was done tying the couple up, he picked up a large rock and began beating Christopher on the head with it. He hit him over and over until it was clear that the man was dead. Then he moved over to Holly and began beating her with his bare hands. He broke her jaw in one of her eye sockets, also cutting her head and neck with his ring. After she lost consciousness, he sexually assaulted her and then dragged her body into the bushes. He tore down some branches and used them to cover Christopher's body before hopping on a train headed back to Mexico. Holly didn't die, though. She woke up and was able to make her way to a nearby house where she got help. Holly was rushed to the hospital where she recovered from her wounds and she was eventually able to help a sketch artist draw a composite of her attacker. But other than that, the investigators had no other leads. The case went cold and people weren't sure if it would ever be solved. After the murder of Norman and Karen Cernick in 1999, the FBI used a program called the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, or VICAP, to look for any other unsolved cases that were similar to the three crimes they already had connected to Angel. They found the case in Lexington and were able to compare the sketch to pictures of Angel from other arrests. Though it definitely looked like him, Angel's appearance was so nondescript that they couldn't be 100% sure. Fortunately, investigators in Lexington still had DNA they had collected from a rape kit and the FBI was able to make a positive match. On May 28th, investigators found the Cernix truck near a rail yard in San Antonio. It was later learned that Angel was caught by immigration agents in El Paso as he crossed back into Mexico. They questioned him and released him back into Mexico, but by this time there was a nationwide arrest warrant for him, so he should have been arrested. Immigration agents claimed that their computer wasn't linked to any other law enforcement databases, something that was later denied by the Justice Department. It seemed that the agents were just eager to get another Mexican citizen out of the U.S. and didn't properly do their job. Because of that, Angel was back in the U.S. two days later where he killed 26-year-old Noemi Dominguez. Noemi was a school teacher who had stayed up late drawing pictures for a children's book she was working on before going to bed. She lived right near the railroad tracks in Houston and while she slept, Angel crept into her house and used a pickaxe he had found outside to kill her. Then he spent time in her home, eating leftovers and drinking beer. Investigators would find that her wallet was open and her ID had been taken out like the other victims. After an estimated hour inside the house, he grabbed some jewelry and cash and snuck back out of the house, taking the pickaxe with him. 
He took Noemi's 1993 Honda Civic and drove west to a very small town called Dubina, where 73-year-old Josephine Convica lived. This town was just outside of Weimar, where Norman and Karen Cernick were killed and Josephine had actually attended their memorial service. Once inside her house, Angel used the same pickaxe to strike Josephine in the head while she slept. It seemed that Angel had tried to take Josephine's car, but he wasn't able to for some reason. He must have left in Noemi's Honda. At about 7.30 that evening, Josephine's daughter and son-in-law came by the house to check on her and the cows she kept in her field. Her daughter went inside where she found her mother had been murdered. Investigators found that cash and jewelry was left behind, but he took little trinkets. There was partially eaten fruit in the kitchen, and a newspaper had been placed on the couch showing an article about the murder of Norma and Karen Cernick. In one bedroom, a toy train was placed on the bed. Investigators got the feeling that Angel was taunting them. The following morning, Brenda Dominguez became worried when she hadn't been able to contact her sister in days. They were supposed to meet up the day before, but she never showed up. Now she wasn't answering her phone. That evening, Brenda went to her house to check on her. There, they found Noemi's body in her bed. Investigators eventually determined that Noemi had likely been killed a few hours before Josephine. It looked as though Angel had turned from serial killer to spree killer. His next murder could happen at any moment, if it hadn't already. On June 12th, police in a small town near San Antonio found Noemi's car abandoned near some railroad tracks. There was a knife sitting on the front seat. Angel returned to Rodeo where he spent time with his wife, rode his bicycle, and attended a birthday party for a neighbor's child. Julietta could tell that something was wrong with him, but he refused to talk about it. To everyone in Rodeo, he was the nice guy in town who used to teach English at the convent. He would hang out in the town square and pleasantly chat with local cops. On June 12th, things changed as Angel saw a story about himself in the local newspaper. Unfortunately, there was no picture and they still believed that his name was Rafael Resendez Ramirez, so people in town didn't link the story to the local former English teacher. The FBI had placed a $125,000 bounty on Angel's head. Bounty hunters from all over the U.S. and Mexico began searching for him and they were determined to deliver him to the U.S. authorities, dead or alive. The FBI had learned that Angel had a sister, Manuela Materino, who lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She didn't have much contact with him, but he would drift into town every so often and stay with her for a few days before disappearing. She didn't want to be associated with him if he was really a killer. She said she'd call if she heard from him. This must have been around the time they learned of his true identity and the knowledge that he had a house in Rodeo. They got permission from the Mexican government to put surveillance on his house, but he had already fled by then. When they spoke to Julieta, she couldn't believe her sweet husband had done what they were saying. Still, she offered them over 100 pieces of jewelry, much of which would be directly linked to Angel's victims. She also had other trinkets, like little statues that had been taken from some of the victims, as well as a guitar. By June 15th, Angel had taken a train into the U.S. and made it all the way to Illinois. Just over the border from Missouri, Angel jumped from the train and headed to a large house sitting on the horizon. He snuck into the house and found a shotgun, which he used to shoot 80-year-old George Morber in the head. Then he turned his attention to George's daughter, 52-year-old Carolyn Frederick, and beat her to death with the shotgun before sexually assaulting her. He stole a few trinkets, ate food, and then stole George's red Chevy pickup. Authorities in Illinois weren't sure that the crime was the work of the railroad killer, though. They found graffiti on a wall that read, No more Serbians, kill by your sons. One of the FBI agents had read letters that Angel had written while he was previously in prison, and he seemed to write a lot of political messages to people, and that actually made the FBI more confident that it was Angel. The next day, a witness saw Angel drop off the pickup truck in Cairo, Illinois, about 60 miles south near the junction of the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. The same day, he was seen at a homeless shelter in the area. Each time, he managed to vanish before authorities could get there. 
Two days after the murder of George and Carolyn, the FBI matched Angel's DNA to DNA collected at other crime scenes and officially placed him as the primary suspect in the murders. They also put him at the top of the FBI's most wanted list. It seemed as though things were closing in on Angel. The FBI was closing in in the U.S. and bounty hunters were closing in in Mexico. Over the next month, authorities were running all over the country following up on sightings. Louisville, Kentucky, Denver, Colorado, and all over Texas. But they were either cases of mistaken identity or Angel had already left by the time authorities got there. On July 11th, Angel's sister called authorities and told them that Angel was going to give himself up. The fear of being killed by bounty hunters superseded the thought of going to prison. When authorities arrived at her house the next day, she told him that he would surrender, but he needed assurances. Eventually, he agreed to surrender to one specific Texas Ranger working the case, who had promised he would be treated humanely and be able to receive visits from his family. So basically, he didn't want to be treated like he treated his victims. Classic. On the morning of July 13th, on a border crossing over the Rio Grande between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, Angel peacefully surrendered to the U.S. authorities. Once he was taken into an interview, Angel talked about everything but the crimes he was accused of. He made it clear that he didn't like America or Americans. I guess he made that pretty clear by killing a bunch of them. He talked about how he disliked capitalism, how Americans treated migrant workers, and even the NATO bombings in Yugoslavia. One of the investigators asked him the same thing most of us are thinking right now. If you hate it here so much, why did you keep coming back? Angel didn't answer the question, he just changed the subject to a mathematical theory involving the number zero. While preparing to hold Angel accountable for his crimes, Angel's family began claiming that they had been promised that the death penalty would be taken off the table if Angel surrendered. Texas authorities denied this claim, which seems believable. It's Texas. That one state is responsible for most executions in the country. They made it clear that the fact was well known in Mexico, so there should have been no confusion. It turned out that they believed the promise of being treated humanely meant that they would not sentence him to death. They clearly don't understand Texas. Angel could have also easily turned himself into Mexican authorities and been assured he wouldn't have received the death penalty. Mexico is against the death penalty and any negotiations to extradite a prisoner to the U.S. always comes with an agreement that the U.S. authorities cannot seek the death penalty. In negotiating his own surrender, he did not secure that agreement. Some believe that he didn't want to turn himself into Mexican authorities because they were interested in talking to him about a number of unsolved homicides in Mexico, specifically in the areas where he had lived. Though Angel claimed to hate Americans, it was unlikely that he never killed in Mexico. He clearly had an urge to kill that was outside any need to steal. There was a part of him who could spend time at home with his wife and be the nicest guy in town, but another that had an uncontrollable need to kill. Since Angel surrendered to U.S. authorities, the unsolved murders in Mexico that fit his M.O. remain unsolved. Then the inquiries from other jurisdictions who had similar unsolved cases started piling up. In the first week after Angel surrendered, there were 700 cases from across the country that other law enforcement agencies thought could have been carried out by Angel. Many of them were not and were ruled out based on information that wasn't made public by Texas investigators that didn't match the crime scenes. Investigators had never made it public that Angel spent time in the houses after each murder, eating food and looking through the victim's belongings. They were able to use those details to narrow down some of the cases, but there were still quite a few that could have been carried out by Angel. Many of those cases are still unsolved. The family of George Morber and Carolyn Frederick announced that they would be filing a $10 million lawsuit against the federal government for allowing Angel to go free on June 2nd. They believed that their loved ones would still be alive if immigration officers had done a proper background check on Angel before sending him back into Mexico. They're likely correct. Angel was charged with four murders, but prosecutors only took one charge to trial, the rape and murder of Dr. Claudia Benton. Committing a murder during the commission of a robbery made it a capital case which made Angel eligible for the death penalty. When the trial began, Angel Resendez pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. The prosecution pointed out how Angel used the rails to move around the country unnoticed, used multiple aliases, and preyed on the most vulnerable. 
all signs of well-thought-out and rational plans to carry out and get away with brutal crimes. Angel claimed that he believed he was half-angel, half-demon, who was capable of causing floods, earthquakes, and explosions. He said that he killed people who radiated evil. The prosecutor pointed out that he killed a doctor, a pastor, a schoolteacher, and multiple elderly people, none of whom had any history of acts that could be considered evil. Then the prosecution called Angel's cellmate from his first prison sentence in Florida to the stand. This witness would describe the times that he would sit in the library with Angel, studying law books and talking about how to use the insanity defense to overturn their convictions. Then they pointed out that Angel had been profiting off of his notoriety after his surrender by selling letters, autographs, locks of hair, and fingernail clippings to morbid fans, even claiming he wouldn't sell anything for less than $50 since he was famous. On May 18, 2000, Angel Resendez was found guilty of capital murder. At the sentencing phase of the trial, the prosecutor was allowed to bring up the other murders carried out by Angel. Most damning was the testimony from Holly Dunn Pendleton, who described watching her boyfriend's head be crushed with a large rock before being beaten and raped by the defendant. All the defense was able to do was beg for the jury to show mercy on Angel. Hmm, I wonder if any of his victims begged for mercy. Maybe his plea should be ignored as well. When the jury came back with their sentence recommendation, they had voted unanimously for death. After the trial, Angel waived most of his appeals in order to speed up the process of being executed. He said he would rather die than live in prison. He also confessed to multiple other murders before his execution. On top of Christopher Mayer, Claudia Benton, Norman and Karen Cernick, Noemi Dominguez, Josephine Convicka, George Morber, and Carolyn Frederick, the palm print from Leafy Mason came back as a match to Angel. He also admitted to killing an unknown woman just east of San Antonio, Texas. He claimed that they had been traveling together, but she disrespected him, so he shot her to death and left her body in an abandoned farmhouse. She was found on March 26, 1986. He said he thought her name might be Norma, but couldn't remember. Her remains have never been identified. He said then he killed a man that was her boyfriend and dumped his body in a creek. He believed the man was also a transient and killed him because he learned that he practiced black magic. If this murder is true, the body has never been found. Then he admitted to killing 22-year-old Michael White in San Antonio on July 19, 1991. His body was discovered in the front yard of an abandoned house downtown, but the case remained unsolved. Angel claimed that he killed Michael because he was a homosexual and he drew a map detailing the crime. After confirming details of his story, authorities closed the case. Angel also confessed to killing 19-year-old transient Jesse Howell, whose body was discovered near railroad tracks in Ocala, Florida on March 23, 1997. He said he had beaten Jesse with an air hose coupler and then he sexually assaulted and strangled his 16-year-old girlfriend, Wendy Von Huben. He instructed investigators to where he would find her body buried in a shallow grave. Authorities believed he was telling the truth because the details about what the killer used as a weapon to kill Jesse had never been released. Their belief was confirmed when they found Wendy's remains buried in a shallow grave exactly where Angel had described on July 15, 2000. Finally, he also confessed to killing 81-year-old Fanny Byers in Carl, Georgia on December 10, 1998, just seven days before he killed Claudia Benton. A man and his girlfriend were initially charged with the murder, but the charges were dropped after Angel confessed with intimate details about the killing. On June 27, 2006, Angel Resendez was executed by lethal injection. He was 45 years old. He tried to come up with excuses for why he killed. He hated Americans. He was trying to rid the world of evil. He was insane. But the reality was, he was just a monster who wanted to kill. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. 
If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again and be safe.